Welcome, everyone. My name is Bill Snow. I'm the titular host for this series of webinars, and we hope you were with us last week. If not, I think the webinar is, will be available for you to view. Um, this second webinar is uh, for also for Vaccine Awareness Day, um, 25th anniversary. And this on this in this session, we're focusing on clinical trials. So. Um, the last session was more about products and platforms, and uh, next week we'll have a final webinar that will be a chat and try and bring it all together with the panel. Um, so if, without further ado, we have three speakers today. Um, we're going to listen to them one after the other and then try and salvage as much time as we can at the end. Um, please, uh, if you have questions, put them into the Q&A. Uh, when they occur to you, and we'll keep track of those and ask them as, as, as we're able. Um, so our first speaker is Robin Shattuck. Robin, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, here come my slides. So um, hello and welcome to everybody. Um, it's a, a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to give you a hopefully relatively brief overview of experimental medicine vaccine trials. Um, and then uh, the second speaker will follow up in terms of what HVTN is doing in that space. So to some respect, in some respects, you're gonna get a prime and then a boost um, about experimental trials um, through these two presentations. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, how do we define experimental medicine trials? Well, my definition is these are clinical investigations undertaken to test or generate a scientific hypothesis that advances vaccine discovery and development, but provides no direct prophylactic or therapeutic benefit to the participant. And really it's the second part of that sentence that's important. These are clinical trials that are absolutely key to accelerating discovery of vaccines, but the participants in the trial um, will not necessarily benefit because they may be at an early stage of development um, and uh, will, on it, as individual products, not necessarily have any protective or therapeutic benefit. Uh, next slide. So these differ from conventional phase, uh, conventional trials, where usually you progress from a phase one trial all the way through to late phase four testing, where you have a clinical product that you think will have clinical benefit, and you're in that pipeline of just testing it and going through all the phases through to licensure. Um, most experimental medicine trials, although um, most often conducted under phase one guidelines are really to progress the science rather than the products. Um, and they are often iterative in nature. That means you may test an initial product, see how it works, and then you may have to then come back and test it in combination with other vaccine constructs um, in order to understand what's needed perhaps to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies or provide uh, effective T cells that can control disease progression, or maybe both together. Um, so in their individual cycles, um, they are unlikely to progress further in their own right. Next slide. Um, so, so why even do this? Well, I think uh, we're at an important point in terms of discovery science, um, in terms of developing protective and therapeutic HIV vaccines. And that is because we now recognize that most of the easy things, the kind of things that worked for COVID-19 vaccines um, are not so easy to solve for HIV. That many of the animal models aren't fully predictive of human responses. This is particularly true of when we're looking at inducing broadly neutralizing antibodies that need to interact with human B cells uh, where they're germline encoded. That means in terms of you know, in, their, in their genome um, that would be different to animal models. 
And so ultimately, the best model for developing a vaccine that will be effective in humans is humans um, and any other animal model. While it may be informative, is never going to give you the same quality of information. Um, and I think also we recognize that it's becoming more expensive to put wishful candidates that may or may not work into large efficacy trials. And so we really need to have better understanding of the science so that when we do these large trials, we have much higher level of confidence that they may work killing other candidates early um, in clinical trials where we see that they may have uh, a low chance of success, um, given that the expenses in the large trials and the fantastic um, successes in terms of both treatment, but also in terms of other prevention technologies mean that actually, hopefully, incidence of HIV will come down. And as a consequence, clinical trial efficacy trials will have to get larger and so they'll get even more expensive. We all recognize that there's a real need to accelerate HIV vaccine development and that really means that we can't rely on business as usual. We need to uh, up our game uh, and have a high throughput of testing things in humans. But it does come with ethical implications because we it means we would be enrolling volunteers in vaccine trials. Um, well, ultimately, at the end of the process, with a higher probability of its success, but in the process of experimental trials, um, volunteers would be uh, receiving vaccines that would be unlikely to benefit them. Um, and so there needs to be clear communication, appropriate um, consent, and motivation of the participants where essentially they're enrolling to be partners in clinical research. Next slide. So uh, the, the whole approach to experimental medicine vaccine trials is to accelerate HIV vaccine development and to address questions that can't be sold solely in animal models. Um, provide opportunities for earlier iterations, and often doing clinical trials in parallel to some of the animal models as well, um, because that both increases our understanding of how useful animal models may or may not be, um, and deepens our scientific understanding. And as you may have heard from the last session um, that was on different platforms and models, there is now a, a really fantastic suite of new, what we call structural based design for uh, vaccine candidates coming through that need to be tested in a more accelerated fashion if we are to see vaccines uh, that have efficacy in a meaningful life uh, time scale. Um, and many of these trials involve more in depth uh, sampling and analysis than you would do on a large scale trial. Next slide. Um, this is a kind of a, a list that shows traditional phase one trials uh, next to experimental medicine trials. Um, you can see there's a lot of similarities, but uh, they're usually the experimental medicine trials is usually smaller numbers um, and of a shorter time period. Next slide. So let me give you a couple of examples and you'll get some more in the second talk. Um, but one example would, of an experimental trial, which is actually going on right now, is to look at uh, immunogens that are what we call germline targeting immunogens. Uh, for example, the EOD GT8 uh, immunogen designed by Bill uh, Sheaf that is going into a, a number of trials to see whether it can uh, induce the human immune system to take the first step in the right direction for inducing one type of broadly neutralizing antibody. So it's a critical scientific question, but because it's only, if it works, moving uh, the B cell response, if you like, one step in a long journey, it won't lead to, to, to a protective response, even though it will help us understand if this first immunogen 
is doing the right job to be the first in the series of other immunogens that may be needed to actually get to breadth of neutralization. Next slide. And so uh, this shows a, a diagram that many of you have seen where you may need a series of immunogens, starting with this first one that can engage with naive uh, B cell repertoire in humans. Uh, if you could click again. Um, and so the uh, experimental medicine trial with the uh, EOD GT8 is essentially looking at this first step in this potential series. And one would need to come back, yeah, if you could press again, um, and look at the second step, uh, the third step, and the fourth step. So you can see that if you're only doing this first part, while scientifically important, uh, you're not going to get the benefit of inducing broadly neutralizing antibodies because it will require a number of iterations to understand the science of how to get there. Next slide. So here's a second example, one that again we are, are using in Europe, um, and here it's where we've produced a range of different stabilized native-like trimers, um, up to eight of them. They, uh, <clears throat> their analysis has been uh, supported by a pivotal preclinical toxicology study. They've been made in small batches, and they are now going through experimental medicine trials to understand how they could be used and in what combinations to start to push B cell responses to uh, neutralization breadth. Next slide. Okay, so sorry, and then the next slide. So this gives you, again, some examples of what experimental medicine trials might look like. So uh, a first series would look at four different immunogens, perhaps given sequentially. A second experimental medicine trial might look at them uh, being given uh, as a combination in a prime and three different boosts, or they could be given in a range of series where you might prime with an individual construct, come back with two, boost with three, and then maybe polish with four. Now, there are many different iterations, but it's just to give you the example of the type of combin combinatorial uh, approaches that need to be evaluated in humans and why this can uh, needs to be done at small scale in terms of small trials, and how addressing all these different scientific concepts in the majority of cases, uh, it won't lead to a breadth of neutralization that may have a protective uh, utility. Next slide. So um, the reason for doing this is really that it may, may save time and money. The most important aspect is really the time saving. Um, and, and that's because uh, the time of doing iterative trials um, will be long if we can't do more trials in a quicker uh, and, and faster fashion. The good news is that now there's lots of new platforms um, and new ways of making immunogens faster and quicker and getting them into clinical trials. They can be done in smaller scale, um, what we call phase appropriate production. Um, that means that they can be uh, approved um, by the regulators as a series of immunogens um, and supported by a, a single pivotal toxicology study in many cases, rather than having to do uh, individual toxicology studies for every single immunogen that you might want to test. Next slide. Um, and so uh, it leaves us into a, a new era of terms of looking at the way we think about clinical clinical trials, where they're not just about taking a single shot at goal and hoping to run all the way. They're about doing uh, intense scientific analysis to understand the pathways of getting there. Um, and you can see some of the challenges uh, that, that that raises, but it also raises uh, really uh, important opportunities for us to understand the science and accelerate uh, the development of effective HIV vaccines. Next slide. 
So what we hope will be possible in the future, well, it is actually possible now, is that we will start to see these small scale trials where you start off with uh, an immunogen or a series of immunogens, you test them in a small number of individuals, you then uh, perform very in-depth immunological e evaluation of the response to those immunogens, that gives you the, the scientific tools to then uh, look at further design iterations of the vaccine candidates themselves to then produce those and refine the process of uh, human immunogen vaccine design until you get a candidate or a series of vaccines that give a level of neutralizing breadth or if it was T-cell, a level of uh, breadth of T-cell response that has real uh, excitable and plausible utility um, in terms of preventing or controlling HIV, that it then merits going into a conventional phase one to phase four development program. Um, and so uh, I think the field is increasingly looking to use this uh, not in uh, a, a, as the only tool for helping to accelerate vaccine discovery, but as, as a new tool and an important tool to help us move forward uh, in an accelerated fashion for the future. Next slide. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hopefully that's a good introduction. Um, I've tried to keep to time so that we have uh, time for discussion at the end. And I will hand over to the next presenter. Great. Thanks, Robin. Um, uh, and I'll just do a, a little, a quick little transition to um, to, to Gail. But just to say um, a big thank you. I think um, some of us have have heard that uh, presentate that your wonderful overview of the experimental medicine vaccine trials a number of times. But every time I hear it, I learn something new. And um, so thank you for always agreeing to come and present it to us. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Gail Broder, who um, is, is known and loved by many. Um, Gail is an associate director um, within the Social Behavioral Science and Community Engagement Unit at the HBTN and has been there for, she told us, um, almost 19 years now um, and just leads really um, amazing community engagement. And we asked her to come and kind of give, give the boost to the presentation, it specifically I think to give um, this audience a sense of, you know, the HVTN is actually conducting these experimental medicine trials and um, to give everyone a sense of, of what the sort of community engagement pieces have, have looked like there. So over to you, Gail. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with everybody this morning. Um, so let me kind of piggyback a, a little bit on Robin's just to, to set the stage and give you a sense of how we're explaining these uh, studies to the communities that the HVTN is working in. So next slide, please. Um, so again, um, we are, I, I noticed Robin and AVAC are using the acronym EMVT. Um, we have not adopted that. We are calling them the XMED studies, experimental medicine. Um, again, emphasizing that they're exploratory in nature. And these are specifically vaccine studies. Uh, many of you know that the HVTN also does studies of broadly neutralizing antibodies, but those have um, their own pathway for development. Um, so these are vaccine studies, and if you're ever looking at reports of an HVTN study, they all have a 300 series numbering, if that helps you um, identify them um, and spot them. Um, as Robin noted, they're generally much smaller than traditional phase one trials. And um, this was included in the table Robin showed. They don't necessarily always use a placebo or a control group. They may be designed in a way where everyone is getting the experimental product. Next slide, please. Um, they are often first in human studies, products um, that we uh, are testing for the first time. And similarly, we're often using uh, new adjuvants that are not yet uh, approved. And many times the adjuvants may be first in human as well. Um, and I think one of the key things, and Robin noted this, is that we're really adding on uh, a number of additional procedures to really examine the immune responses in different ways. So not just looking at some of the traditional things like 
Um, you know, does the body make antibodies? Does the body make T cells? What do those numbers look like? Um, but really trying to get into the nitty gritty. Um, and so we do that with additional procedures, uh, leukophoresis, where we're able to collect a higher volume of white blood cells, fine needle aspiration, which is um, taking a biopsy of cells from the lymph nodes um, in the upper arm. So in the areas close to where the vaccine was administered to see if we're um, finding any changes in the B cells in those lymph nodes. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of what that looks like in a minute. Um, and we're also testing some different approaches that could potentially improve all vaccines and not just um, the added value for a particular product. And one example of that is a study that's gonna be opening within the next a month or so, um, the idea of fractional dosing, where instead of giving the dose all at once in a single injection, you break it down into smaller parts and give a series of smaller injections over a couple of weeks. And I'll show you um, an example of a study that's doing that as well. Next slide, please. So um, Robin touched on this as well. Why do we need these XMED studies? So one of the things that we've learned in just the past couple of years um, from the AMP studies was that BNAVs, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, do have the potential to be protective. Um, the AMP studies showed us that there, um, it's not just the antibody itself, but the, the strain of HIV that a person might be exposed to. Um, and so we got more work to do there. But now we really have some proof that because we know that the, the antibodies can in fact be protective, we need to really hone in on how do we get a vaccine to induce that response? How do we get the body to make BNABs rather than just the ordinary antibodies that most of us have? Uh, because BNABs are more rare. Um, and then as Robin was explaining, um, our B cells make these antibodies along a, a particular path, the germline targeting. And it's important to test the very start of the vaccine strategy, the priming, as Robin just showed us, before we move on to test the rest of the regimen or the other pieces of the regimen. We need to know if we're on the right path. And so, you know, really trying to get it right from the start is really critical. And one of the ways that this was talked about uh, at the recent HVTN meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of our partners at the Gates Foundation, Dr. Nina Russell, used the expression that we have to fail faster. So instead of getting all the way to a phase three study with thousands of people to find out the vaccine doesn't work, we wanna try to get more products in the pipeline, do a number of small trials, and sort of get these early readouts and see if we're even on the right path so that if the product doesn't show that potential from the very get-go, we can weed it out and move on to other ideas more quickly, more expeditiously in smaller studies. So, you know, the, the human resource of the numbers of participants that are needed is, is not infinite. So we wanna make sure that we're not just using our financial resources appropriately, but our human resources as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an idea, and I've copied these out of some of the protocols that we're working on, both in the field and in development, just to give you a sense of what are these um, the scientific questions look like. So the objective is the scientific question, and the endpoint are the pieces of data from the study that will be used to answer that question. And so in a traditional phase one study, we're looking specifically at safety how well the body can tolerate the vaccine. And then we start to inquire about the immune response. And so as you can see here, we've revised the primary objectives a little bit. We've condensed safety and tolerability into a single question. And you can see the kinds of data that we're gonna be looking for to evaluate that safety. And frankly, that's the same as we've done in phase one studies traditionally. Um, but then we're starting to get these immune responses elevated into our primary scientific questions. So really looking, are we 
um, expanding the CD4 binding site uh, cross-reactive B cells? Are we in, uh, including these B cells that we think can produce broadly neutralizing antibodies like VRCO1? Um, you know, comparing these different types of dosing. We're going to be looking at these specific cells. We're going to be doing more elaborate kinds of laboratory tests. We're going to be doing genetic sequencing. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, a much more detailed set of secondary objectives. Can we look at um, the quality of and quantity of binding antibodies? Can we look at the impacts of these different approaches like the fractional dosing? Can we look at the neutralizing properties? Um, so we're really getting down into the weeds um, and really you know, taking a very fine tooth comb to these different kinds of immune responses, using these different kinds of uh, assays in the lab. Uh, you'll see one noted there on the third row, the TVMBL assay. That was an assay that was tried for the first time in the AMP studies and was able to uh, be uh, validated. And we now know that that's a good predictor of which antibodies can actually be protective. So we'll be seeing that uh, come along more frequently, I believe. And then next slide, please. And then we've also added exploratory objectives. Uh, and again, here, you know, we're recognizing that these are studies with a small number of people. So they may only give us some hints. They may not give us definitive answers. But again, we can look at these issues and sort of know, are we pointing ourselves in the right direction? Are we seeing things happening in the B cell repertoire? Are we seeing these rare lineages that we think are associated with broadly neutralizing antibodies? Can we really um, look into this germinal center activity as Robin was describing um, and do, you know, really some more, um, perhaps more experimental kinds of assays, not necessarily always the validated assays that really help us get into the nitty gritty of what's happening in the immune system. Next slide, please. And so um, I wanted to show you a couple of examples from some of the studies, both in the field and in development. Um, HVTN 300 is currently enro um, fully enrolled. Uh, it's the only enrolled 12 participants. So there's an example for you of a, a smaller, more focused study. Um, and it's currently in follow-up. Participants are getting four injections over the first year of the study. And then there's um, additional time for follow-up after that. And you can see here, we've uh, in the highlighted rows, we've added these new procedures. So we've asked volunteers to um, have this lymph node cell collection, the, this biopsy procedure once. And we've asked them to do this larger blood draw, a leukapheresis. Um, if that procedure is not familiar to you, um, it basically involves having um, a tube in each of your arms. Um, so that the blood is being taken out of one arm and it goes into a machine that separates the blood into its various components, the red cells, the white cells, and so on, um, collects the white cells. And then in a second tube that goes into your other arm, it gives you all the rest of your blood back so that we're only collecting the white cells. Um, and in that way, we can stay within the blood collection limit um, that are uh, a global standard. Um, and we can get more of those white blood cells, which is where those B cells uh, live and the T cells as well. Um, and we can really do more study because we have a, a larger volume of cells to work with. The rest of the procedures in the study look very familiar, the same kinds of things we've been doing in phase one trials all along. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, here's a, another sample. This is uh, 301, which should be opening, I would say, in the next four to six weeks. Um, and this is looking at this idea of comparing the traditional method of administering the dose all at once, which is known as a bolus delivery, and comparing that to what happens if we take the same total dose, so let's say 100 milligrams, just for the sake of argument, um, and then break that down into smaller injections. 
And so that same 100 milligram dose is now gonna be divided up into six smaller doses given twice a week over three weeks. Um, and so in addition to being smaller doses, they're gonna gradually increase in size. So the first uh, of those six might be one milligram, the second might be five milligrams, then 10, then 20 and so on. So that the total dose is the same, 100 milligrams. Um, it really boils down to whether we see a difference in the immune responses if the dose is given all at once or if the dose is given progressively over time and seeing if that has any added value um, to the way the body uh, responds. And so that study is gonna be getting underway shortly. Um, I do wanna note that it's still under regulatory review and not yet final. So what you see here could change from what actually uh, winds up going into the field in a few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. 305 is still uh, is also still in development. Um, it's on track to probably open up in the uh, um, in the American autumn, so maybe September October ish. Um, and this is a, a slightly bigger study uh, using a combination of a DNA vaccine and a protein vaccine. You can see that across the different arms of the study, we'll also be comparing dosages. So uh, if there's a difference between the immune responses given at the lowest dose, um, where it will be a first in human application. So we wanna start small and, and make sure that it's safe and well tolerated before we increase the dose. Um, the second group, uh, assuming there's a good safety readout in that first group, the second group will also get just the DNA vaccine, but at a higher dose. And then again, assuming a safety readout that's favorable, the third group would get the DNA vaccine and add a protein boost. Um, one of the things that's slightly different about the study is the way that it's being given. Um, most of the time we hear about vaccines being given into the muscle. This vaccine is gonna be given um, subcutaneously between the layers, excuse me, I misspoke, intradermally, um, between the layers of the skin. Um, if any of you have ever had a TB test where you get that, it looks like a little bubble uh, under the skin on your arm. That's what we're talking about. The vaccine is gonna be given um, between the layers of the skin. And then we're gonna follow up the DNA vaccine with a procedure called electroporation that administers a small electrical shock at the same time the vaccine is given. And what that does is allow the pores in your skin to open up and become uh, porous and um, allowing our cells to uptake that liquid in, of the uh, vaccine more quickly and get it into the cells faster um, and seeing if that will help us um, build a, a stronger immune response. So we've done electroporation before intramuscularly the study is going to look at it intradermally. That'll be only the, the second trial to do that. We've had one other study previously that looked at intradermal uh, administration. So um, lots of firsts here. Um, again, participants are gonna get leukapheresis at two time points and uh, groups two and three are also going to get the lymph node biopsies at two points. So um, we'll be, spending a lot of time explaining procedures with this study. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to just take a minute to, to comment on this. Um, Robin did a beautiful overview of really describing the kinds of things that we're gonna have to explain to volunteers. And I wanna emphasize that as well. Um, in the HVTN, our sites are being held to all of the same kinds of requirements for community engagement. They continue to have annual plans that outline how they're going to work with their communities to explain these concepts and engage the public. Um, they continue to work with their cabs. Our protocol teams continue to have community representation who are involved in the writing of the studies and writing the consent forms. Um, the review processes in the HVTN continue to have community representation from the earliest stages of concept development 
um, to our scientific uh, governance committee that approves all the study budgets, um, to our uh, scientific review committee that looks at uh, the individual protocol concepts and decides whether they should advance. So all of that community engagement work is unchanged. Um, it, it will continue to be as you have seen from us in the past. The biggest difference, and I think Robin alluded to this, is really in the informed consent procedures. Um, not just the consent form, but any supplemental materials. So we're really going into a lot more depth to make sure that people understand how these procedures work, what will happen to you, um, what, uh, what the purpose of doing these procedures is, what's the value of them, why are we asking you to undergo all of this. Um, we're creating other kinds of supplemental materials to show pictures, uh, if relevant, uh, for example, with electroporation, um, there is some potential risk for there to be marks on the skin following that procedure. And we have um, a photo array from the previous study that we did so that we can show volunteers um, some examples of what those marks on the skin might look like so that they understand uh, you know, what it looks like initially when you first have the procedure, how the marks fade over time, we have data out to 12 or 18 months um, to show folks um, how it fades over time and, and so on, so that they can really fully understand what it is we're asking them to, to take on and, and truly make an informed decision. Um, the consent forms are definitely getting longer. Um, and so we've really been working with our community members on these protocol teams to help us really drill down, make the language as simple as we can create slide decks um, to uh, provide some visual aids and help people really um, make the most out of that information. Next slide, please, I believe is my acknowledgement. I just wanna recognize um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Will Hahn, who is really uh, at the forefront of HBTN's XMED efforts. And he's one of our clinical trials physician and is a protocol team leader on a number of these studies. So wanna acknowledge his help in preparing these slides. And I think that's the last. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Gail. Um, I think a lot to um, a lot to take in and a lot to um, discuss there. I'm gonna we're our over time, so I'm gonna quickly hand it over to um, our last presenter. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Pontiano Kalibu, who is um, uh, a, a longtime friend and colleague um, to me personally, and I know to many people. Uh, Pontian is the director of the Uganda Virus Research Institute in Entebbe, Uganda. He, he's also the director of um, the MRC, UVRI, and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Uganda Research Unit. So lots of roles there and just a wealth of experience um, from, uh, from the bench to, to clinical trials. And he's going to um, talk to us about uh, this sort of novel trial prep back, as well as some other um, kind of African-led clinical trials. So over to you, Pontiano. Do you want me to show the slides or? Go ahead. Yes, please. And the, so I'll have to, yeah. Yep. And if you have any trouble, we can share from our side. Okay. Let me share. Um, sorry. Um, no worries. I need, I need to share this to share. Is that okay? You're sharing, you're still in um, you're still in slide deck mode. So you yep. might need to just put it into the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, so that's true. There. Is that okay? Okay, um, thank yes. you. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I was requested to talk about our prep back trial, which is a phase two B trial that we're conducting uh, um, in a number of African countries. And also I was requested to give another example of a, a trial whereby we have really African leadership. And I decided to go for the GO3 protocol, which fits in very well with the previous speakers uh, talking about experimental uh, medicine uh, 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 trials. So uh, the PrevVac is a phase 2B trial, three arm, two stage, HIV prophylactic vaccine trial with a second randomization uh, to compare uh, 
uh, this covey with Travada as pre-exposure prophylaxis. And later I'll be talking about uh, the IRV G003. But we need to know that uh, although I've listed here, IRV, there are many partners as you've had who are involved uh, in this IRV G003 protocol study, uh, all the way coming from the G001 to the G003 now. Similarly, the PrepVac has a number of partners. And here I've listed uh, some of the partners that are involved in the PrepVac uh, uh, study, uh, a number in Europe, uh, in the US, and many uh, colleagues in the African sites that are participating in these studies. The coordination center is here in Entebbe, uh, Uganda, in, the, uh, in Uganda. Uh, and we're also going to do uh, most of the endpoint immunological assets. We are also coordinating the statistics, the data analysis uh, for this uh, large uh, trial. Hence the reason we say it is Africa-led, although it's uh, European enabled. So there's a lot of work going on within the African sites to ensure that uh, we are really leading on this. The objectives are to assess the efficacy of two HIV prophylactic vaccine regimens, uh, each compared to a placebo in preventing acquisition of HIV, and also to determine the effectiveness of discovery PrEP as a function of the effectiveness of Truvada PrEP and hypothetical, hypothetical placebo. When we started uh, this trial, uh, uh, already data had shown that uh, Truvada was a good uh, uh, drug for PrEP, but there wasn't a lot of information on discovery, especially in our uh, population. And the, uh, so there was a need to do this. And we are comparing with the, uh, the, some of the historical data in terms of uh, incidence, but also to determine the safety of these vac vaccines and the, of course, uh, also of these two drugs. The design, it's a three trials in one. As you can see, we have the uh, first is the, the vaccines that are uh, being, it's a randomized control trial. Uh, looking at vaccine combination A, vaccine combination B, and each of these are compared with a placebo in the randomized uh, placebo controlled fashion. Then all these individuals in the initial 24 weeks are given also uh, PrEP, uh, uh, Discovery and the Trovada. But this is open level. PrEP is open level. So all of them are getting uh, uh, recruited, including those on the placebo. This slide, BISA one, but shows uh, the study schema uh, we're using. Uh, one of the combination is the DNA, uh, potential T cell epitope DNA, plus AIDSVAX. AIDSVAX is very well known to many of you that we use in the RV144 study. And we are giving uh, the vaccine uh, at, at, at different uh, time points, week 0, 4, 24, 48. Uh, that's one combination. Uh, and we are giving them uh, together at the same time. We did a study, phase one a study, using this combination uh, when you give the vaccines uh, at the same time in both arms and were able to induce uh, quite good uh, antibodies. It was one of the reasons that we went to do this study to look at this. The other combination is again using a DNA uh, together with the GP140 that has been uh, with the MPLA as an adjuvant. Uh, given at uh, uh, weeks at the second visit, visit and the fourth visit, and then that as, as uh, 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 priming, and then we are uh, boosting, and then we also give MVA uh, GP140 uh, at uh, 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 other visits, visit, uh, visit uh, uh, eight and visit uh, uh, twelve, and and this uh, uh, GP140 is a trimeric subtype C uh, recombinant protein uh, that is being given. And the placebo is uh, 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 salt water. And as you can see here, we are giving uh, the, uh, the uh, prep uh, up to uh, uh, visit nine, that's around 24 weeks. And we are looking at the effectiveness of prep during these early periods, before uh, the vaccines have really, the time when we think the vaccines have now induced uh, the most potent immune responses. That's when we look at the effectiveness of this uh, PrEP drug. Then for the vaccines, we're only going to take individuals who are negative at week 26. That is after getting the third, third vaccination, the time when we think 
the immune responses are good enough. That's when we start looking at the primary end points for the uh, vaccine. And this is what I'm talking about. The efficacy will be HIV acquisition by a participant who had completed the first three immunizations and was HIV negative at uh, at least, uh, at least two, uh, uh, two weeks uh, after the third uh, immunization. That's around 26 weeks. And I've shown here the analysis, the assumptions made, efficacy, we thought uh, at that time, 70% uh, of the vaccine will be reasonable, knowing that PrEP now, we are in the era of PrEP, where PrEP uh, efficacy is quite high. So we need, we need it quite high efficacy and high incidence populations. And then the safety is the clinical decision to discontinue the vaccine regimen for adverse events that are considered uh, related to the product. A PrEP, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this will be effectiveness. And we'll look at PrEP, uh, HIV acquisition at or before week uh, this two after the third immunization. That's before the, 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 the peak uh, when we, have, we think we have good immune responses. So earlier on, we're looking at uh, PrEP effectiveness. And then later on, uh, we look at uh, PrEP. PrEP is given up to week 24 in our study. And beyond that, uh, participants are taking PrEP uh, according to the uh, standards that are in those uh, different countries. What we know that many of our sites now PrEP is available. Uh, individuals can go and get PrEP. Uh, but as you know, uh, sometimes this has not been as expected. Uh, the uptake of PrEP has not been as really uh, would have wanted. But during the earlier weeks that we are proactively giving PrEP. So the endpoint measure is averted infections ratio. That's a measures the proportion of infections that will be averted by using this coffee rather than uh, uh, Truvada. The tri trial communities, the study is taking place in a number of African countries, Maputo, Maputo Mozambique, although we had a challenge in, in, in Maputo and the uh, recruitment had to be uh, halted. In fact, this study had started because of uh, some challenges there, including the right, having the right populations. We're in the general population in Durban, South Africa, uh, female uh, bar workers in Mbeya, Tanzania, bar workers and female sex workers in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and fisher folk and key populations in Uganda. So it's in uh, those uh, uh, African countries. Where are we now? So far, we have uh, screened in, uh, uh, in uh, most, for instance, in Uganda, and we have uh, enrolled 65% of uh, our uh, 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 target uh, population, uh, that is the volunteers who needed to enroll. The total number for all the study is 1,668. Uh, in Tanzania, in about 64% uh, uh, enrolled. Uh, in Dar es Salaam, about 57% enrolled. And in, uh, uh, in uh, Daban, it's about, uh, um, uh, um, 80% enrolled. So we have, uh, we still have, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We expect it to have fully, to be fully enrolled by the end of the year. So we need to really uh, work very hard to ensure we have had some challenges, COVID challenges, product uh, uh, challenges, but uh, I think uh, we are moving slowly. Oh, sorry, I couldn't move the slide. Uh, now in the last, my few last slides, I think I've given you where we are with the prep back. I want to talk about the G003 phase one, which I think has been alluded to as one of those experimental uh, medicine uh, vaccine trials. And I want to show how Africa is fully uh, involved in this trial. It's a phase one randomized open label uh, study of the E or D, GT8, 16 mar uh, messenger RNA in HIV and infected adults in good health. Uh, and it will, is it supposed to uh, start very soon in Rwanda and South Africa, if it hasn't yet started. And the aims are to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of this vaccine to test whether priming with this uh, vaccine will generate similar uh, VRCO1 class responses as in GO1 and GO2, uh, which was done in the USA, in this African population, 
where HIV vaccine is most needed. This is a, a study uh, in a few individuals, about 18 of them, uh, who will be given uh, two uh, vaccinations, I think week zero uh, start and then week eight, uh, again, to look at uh, immune responses that are induced the aim, of course, of this uh, vaccine and studies, which have been series, GO1, GO2, is to see if we can induce antibodies that are, are of the same uh, uh, nature as the VZO1, but also to increase capacity in uh, novel sampling. It's a phase one clinical trial to assess safety, tolerability. It's the first time this immunogen is being tested in Africa, and it's also being concurrently tested in USA. The inclusion of the African population at this stage of development provides an opportunity for early safety and immunological readouts that can inform the applicability of this strategy uh, in Africa. Uh, I won't go into the details of the vaccine. It is 60 ma messenger RNA. Uh, uh, it is a nanoparticle composed of 60 uh, uh, recombinant proteins uh, that have been engineered with the purpose of really uh, uh, priming, boosting, so that we can have, uh, see whether we can induce the right antibodies. I think very important, what has been talked about the, by the previous speakers, is the capacity that is being built uh, in some of these centers, like Oram Institute in South Africa, the Center for uh, Family Health in uh, Chigari, to do uh, uh, real-time uh, B-cell responses uh, by conducting uh, fine needle aspirate, uh, aspirate techniques, uh, which will be very, very important, but also to perform leukophoresis, uh, which Kale has uh, able to mention. I think this will be very, very important capacity that needs to be built. Here I show some of the teams that are going to be involved. A lot of African capacity uh, uh, is being developed, uh, but also involvement in Cameroon, Kenya, and other centers to look at uh, uh, B cells. Uh, they have uh, really uh, acquired uh, 10x uh, to be able to do B cell uh, analysis and the sequencing, uh, which will be very important, and other labs to do other immunological assays. So I think this is another trial that is really brought has brought uh, African leadership uh, into this exper experimental medicine trial that is quite important as we move forward, as we have heard from other speakers. What are the final remarks? I hope I've shown you that two studies, which are very good examples of innovative trial designs and approaches that can quickly ask and answer key questions with African leadership. PrEP is an adaptive phase to be trial, testing a combined regimen of PrEP plus two combination HIV vaccines. And the G003 is an experimental medicine HIV vaccine trial aimed at answering important questions around inducing the desired PCR responses while at the same time building the required capacity in the African centers. I'd like to end by thanking all the partners and collaborators and funders for the PrEP, but also the funders that are funding IAVI and also those who are involved in the G003 study. Thank you. Thank you, Pontiana. Thank you, all the speakers. Um, we're, we have about five minutes left. left. Let's try and deal with the questions that were posed by the audience. Uh, Patiana, there are a couple of questions about D Descovi. I know um, I'm not sure what you will be able to determine as an outcome from the prep back study, but I know you started it some time ago. You're you're not you're on mute, Pontiano. Indeed, we started this uh, some time back. Uh, and the, the field has moved on. Uh, but as you know, at that time when we started, there wasn't a lot of information on this COVID. We know now, uh, I think this COVID is a, a good drug for PrEP. Uh, we are going to compare safety and effectiveness. It is effectiveness, open label, uh, and compare it with uh, uh, the historical uh, info data we have from our co cohorts. And, and, and elsewhere. So uh, things have changed, but I hope we can get some good information on. Uh, I, I think as we move forward, uh, we're all looking and we think this COVID will take over, <laughs> will be the drug to be used. Uh, but uh, we hope we can get uh, some information that can add uh, knowledge in terms of effectiveness and the, and the, and the safety. So, so as you do this trial, you're 
um, you're counting the number of people who got infected in the in the in the in the run up to the vaccine, right? Where, um, in, in the run up to the uh, the prep trial uh, before we had what we call a registration cohort uh, that we used, and we have the we know the incidence in, in that population. It's the same population that was rolled into this trial uh, that we're looking at. So there will be that comparison. Otherwise, it's open label. Uh, one group is getting to uh, Truvada and the other one's go getting this COVID. Yes. So uh, I'm sorry, just to follow up, when do you think you have to wait till the end of the vaccine portion in order to know what happened in the prep portion? You know, we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to wait. Uh, we can have the results before uh, the end of the, uh, the, 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 the vaccine because it's, it's separate. The, our uh, uh, PrEP is uh, the uh, effect effectiveness is within the initial uh, 24 weeks, whereas the vaccine is uh, after 26 weeks. So uh, we can analyze uh, this data before the end of the vaccine uh, study. And maybe Pontiano, if I can just follow up on that really quickly before we kind of before we shift back to some of the experimental medicine issues. Um, for for the PrEP back, and apologies if you said this in, in your presentation and I missed it, but is the idea if the you know um, if the sort of uh, ideal results are achieved, would that be a licensed product together as sort of a combined kind of prep and vaccine regimen? And maybe just a broader question, and would love to hear Robin or Gail's um, comments on this too. Um, is there kind of thinking amongst the prep vac team about um, kind of broader thinking about how we sort of look into the future of um, you know, I mean, and you said it so well in your presentation of, of, of how to incorporate PrEP into um, HIV vaccine research. I think that's very important. I think we're pragmatic. We knew this is, this is the way we're going to move forward. PrEP is coming. We need to do these studies at the background of PrEP. And in fact, when we designed it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the effectiveness, the efficacy we're talking about of the vaccine is quite high. It's quite a high bar with a background that uh, PrEP will be given. PrEP has, is very effective, yeah. Uh, so we need to have a vaccine that will really be, uh, for those who are making decisions, uh, that will be convincing that, yes, we can use this. And we know if we start using vaccines, our hope is that before the time we know that an individual has developed enough good immune responses to the vaccine, if we have a good vaccine, we should cover that period before with the PrEP. So this is where we think how uh, uh, vaccines together with PrEP will be given in the real world. PrEP has to be given to all populations at risk before <laughs> the vaccine, you have a, a, a good and uh, immune response. And that is the, the way the, the, the trial is also designed. So there will be, uh, and I think that is uh, taking the trials into what is the future? How are we going to deliver all these preventive uh, approaches. Thanks. Robin or Gail, any quick thoughts on that? I mean, I think what Pontiano says is, is correct. It's, it's very unlikely, if not almost certain, that you wouldn't be able to license a vaccine that had to be used in the context of PrEP. I, it was only effective if it was used with PrEP. Um, any, any vaccine that will ultimately be licensed would need, need to be licensed on its own efficacy when it's used by itself. But in terms of global health effectiveness, there may be synergy of the two approaches and, and covering people when they're vulnerable during a vaccination uh, schedule would also be important. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I think that the goal here is protection and whether we get that through an individual product or some combination of products, I think everybody's open to seeing what that looks like. Um, I, I know we're over time I, um, and I think people are hanging on the line. I did want to sort of just come back um, a little bit to this sort of experimental medicine trials issue. And I think Robin and Gail, you gave such nice overviews on sort of the differences and the similarities to kind of the standard phase one trials, but wondering if we could just sort of, um, 
hear from you a little bit of sort of a, 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 a recap on that, but I, I think specifically um, some of the questions that have come up in the chat around how we are sort of explaining this kind of very fine distinction to communities and, and what are some of the kind of, I think, um, bigger picture considerations. Nita Marar, you know, put in this really interesting question around um, kind of future access. And are we thinking about that in the same way with experimental medicine trials as we would with sort of a classic kind of product development um, approach? So, um, so, and I'll just hand it over and hear, what, hear your thoughts because again, we are upset. My sense is no, we're not. And, and precisely because the experimental medicine studies are so early in the game, and the idea that is we want to weed out what doesn't work. So there, you know, there is a level of expectation that many of these products that are going into an XMED study are not going to come to fruition. And, and that's kind of the point. We're trying to, you know, let's try all the ideas and let's weed out what doesn't work. So I think that, and I agree, Nita's question is spot on, but I think that the time for that discussion is a little bit further down the line once we have a sense that something might have potential and we've seen that perhaps we are on the right path and that perhaps this is an idea that's worthy of moving forward. So, um, but I, I agree with Nita entirely. It's really important to engage the, the manufacturers in these discussions, you know, really from the get-go. I mean, I would say it's not actually as big a step as people imagine, because when we do conventional phase one trials uh, in all the consenting process, it's we're testing a vaccine. We don't know whether it will work. We don't know whether you'll get any benefit from it. Um, and so that standard consent process, uh, it's not that different, except we're not testing a single product. So the only difference is if you're testing a single product that's going all the way, then what the discussion about will I get access to this product if it's successful is more uh, relevant. Whereas if it's a scientific question, it's not, it's really definitely not going to go all the way. Then I think that question is more nuanced and it's really about helping a process to get to a, a vaccine at some point in the future which you know ethically should be made available to the most vulnerable groups wherever they may be yeah and and robin you mentioned this earlier with the the question about uh, about benefits and i just wanted to note the hvtn in its phase one studies has always used the language we do not expect this product to benefit you um, and in a placebo controlled trial we even go a step further and say and because you may get the placebo, you know, there really may be no benefit. Um, but where we've drawn a distinction is that we do talk about the fact that people do report the benefit of study participation. Um, for some people that has meant access to medical care that they wouldn't have had otherwise because they're getting uh, regular safety monitoring and labs, their blood pressure checked, their kidney health checked, their liver function checked and so forth. So for some people, that's more medical care than they might have gotten in ordinary circumstances, and that has been a benefit. Um, we've also heard from a number of volunteers over the years about you know, their appreciation for access to risk reduction counseling, access to regular HIV testing, um, the, the social impact uh, that can be positive, like feeling good about yourself because you know that you're helping society and the, the positive uh, you know, reinforcement of your altruism that that generates. So uh, we've tried to draw that line, benefit of the product versus benefit of participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe one way I think to, to, to just sort of wrap it up, I think Gail, that's such a um, kind of a, a, a perfect link to really what I think is sort of the bigger picture issue here is the, I think the very kind of long term and complicated nature of ultimately um, developing a vaccine. And I think, um, you know, maybe something if anyone has any sort of final thoughts about how we, you know, I think both with this idea of a sort of a combined prep and vaccine approach, as well as sort of, you know, not taking a step back necessarily, but sort of turning a corner, I think, with with vaccine research around with um, experimental medicine, how are we 
ensuring that we're sort of explaining to communities why we're doing these things and why, um, you know, why we are where we are with, with HIV vaccine research and why we need to, need to sort of all, you know, all stay in it for the long game. Um, again, I don't think there's any easy answer to that question, but maybe if, if people just have quick thoughts on that as we close. So Stacy, I would like to say that I think it's the uh, it's the responsibility of the people who design these trials to make it very clear why each of the small trials is important and what what will be additive because they're all going to look more or less alike and and people need to know what the what they're contributing um, by enrolling. That's great. Anything to add from others? I mean, I would just add that we need to, we need to, uh, you know, not necessarily for the participants, but for, you know, the wider field and, and, and the globe, argue for the urgency and need mm. for a protective HIV vaccine. I mm. think mm. the world is becoming more complacent about HIV being a chronic condition that can be controlled with treatment and we know that that's not perfect um, mm. and that we have better and better prevention methods but ultimately we need an effective vaccine and I worry that that sense of urgency can be lost both by governments, funders, researchers. Um, you know, it's easy for us all to be complacent and we need to maintain that, that sense of energy and urgency to, to solve this incredibly complex but important issue. Uh, and especially, yeah. <laughs> so briefly, and especially after the success of uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2, these are the questions we're getting. But SARS-CoV-2, you are able to get the vaccine so quickly. What are you doing? Are you really, aren't you trying to just make money? We need really to now, even than before, to tell them how complex HIV is as a virus, but also to get a vaccine. Uh, that question keeps coming, but you managed SARS-CoV-2 very quickly. Is it because it was more global, but HIV is not affecting uh, specific groups? So really we need to do a good job here. Yeah, Tantiana, that's so important. And I know that that's something that in the HBTN we've been talking about a lot because we were also the coordinating center for the, the US government funded COVID vaccine studies. And part of what we've really been talking about is how the HIV work influenced the COVID work. And that people talk, you know, people talk about how quickly we had these mRNA vaccines but they forget that mRNA was in development for 17 years ahead of that um, for other diseases um, before it became applied to COVID. Um, and similarly, that we're now applying lessons learned from COVID onto HIV and, and moving the mRNA, as we heard last week, uh, you know, the mRNA is moving into the HIV space. Um, but I think, you know, just to be self-serving for just a moment, um, Robin really alluded to this beautifully. Part of what we've been seeing, and we've been engaged in a lot of um, market research and trying to understand um, consumers, that um, what we're also seeing is a whole new generation of adults that don't have the memory of HIV and AIDS from the 80s and 90s, that didn't ever see it as um, you know, an, an infection that devastated their social networks, their friends, their loved ones, their lovers, um, you know, that didn't experience those losses firsthand and don't have an appreciation for it as the pandemic that it continues to be. So in the HVTN, we, uh, I would encourage folks to visit um, our new website, helpendhiv.org, um, and which is for the moment a US focused initiative um, it will eventually expand to other regions, but we're starting small um, and trying to really reach that, that new generation to make them aware that um, HIV continues to be a problem and that it will take all of us to solve it in the same way that it has taken all of us globally to solve the COVID question. Um. I'm not sure we solved the COVID question. No. And, and while it's moved it ahead. 
I think we do rec need to recognize, I I'm sure I'm just saying the obvious, that the COVID vaccines are pretty terrible at preventing transmission. Mm. They're mm. good at preventing disease. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. I, and so I, it, a lot of people are hanging on the line, but I think we should go ahead and, and, and wrap up. But I mean, just beautiful conversation, beautiful presentations. Thank you so much again. Um, you know, I think this issue around, we're all thinking about it, you know, this context that we're living in of COVID and how do we kind of, how do we work with that, maintain the urgency around HIV, HIV prevention, HIV vaccine development? Um, but how do we kind of like, Right on the coattails. How do we how do we replicate the urgency around COVID for HIV? Um, that's something I'm really hoping we will bring into the third webinar, which is next week, one week from today, next Tuesday. Um, so hope everyone is planning on tuning into that. Um, and just visit avac.org if you need the info. Um, we I also just want to recognize too, we had a lot of comments and questions coming in kind of towards the end there. So um, we are, and we're planning to kind of do a little bit of crowdsourcing with all of you as registrants to, um, to incorporate questions into that final webinar next week. So rest assured, we are saving all of this Q&A and chat. Um, your questions will not go um, unheard um, and unresponded to. And, and thank you for thank you for those. Thank you for everyone um, remaining on the line. And again, to our just wonderful speakers. And um, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.